Friends, I think it's important for us to understand as we jump back into this series called Faith That Works, is that Christians amidst uh, adversity and even plagues and pandemics is not a new thing. Acting on the gospel message of charity, one writer says, named John Berger, church has been on the front line since early times. Throughout its history, the church has been on the front lines uh, and has responded even in the center of terrible epidemics, even from the earliest days of the church. There was, for one uh, instance, the Antonine Plague of the second century, when one writer says might have killed a quarter of the population of the Roman Empire, but it also likely helped to spread Christianity. Christians, one historian said, cared for the sick and offered a spiritual model whereby plagues were not the work of angry and capricious deities, but the product of a broken creation in revolt against a loving God. Just about a hundred years later, there was a plague of Cyprian, which probably was related to Ebola, and it triggered the explosive growth of Christianity across the Roman Empire. Cyprian's sermons told Christians not to grieve for plague victims who live in heaven, but to redouble their efforts to care for the living. His fellow bishop Dionysius described how Christians, heedless of danger, took charge of the sick, attending to their every need. The emperor Julian, who was a renowned and active pagan, said this, Good was done by the Christians to all men, not merely to the household of faith. The sociologist and religious demographer Rodney Stark claims that death rates in the cities during those times that were occupied with Christian communities may have been just half that of other cities. That's astounding as God worked through this. This habit of sacrificial care has reappeared throughout history. In 1527, when the bubonic plague plague ravaged Wittenberg, Martin Luther refused calls to flee the city and protect himself. Rather, he stayed and ministered to the sick. The refusal to flee cost his daughter, Elizabeth, her life, but it produced a tract that he wrote entitled, Whether Christians Should Flee the Plague. And in it, Luther provides a clear articulation of the Christian epidemic response. We die at our posts. Christian doctors cannot abandon their hospitals. Christian governors cannot flee their districts. Christian pastors cannot abandon their congregations. The plague does not dissolve our duties. It turns them to crosses on which we must be prepared to die. For Christians, it is better that we should die serving our neighbor than surrounded in a pile of masks we never got a chance to use, one commenter said. And if we care for each other, if we share masks and hand soap and canned food, if we are our brother's keeper, we might actually reduce the death toll too. And it's powerful words for us to remember as we consider the fact that the early Christians were the ones to establish hygienic hospitals in Europe to provide care during times of plague. I have witnessed firsthand, says Dr. William Redfield, the director of the CDC, the impact of the faith community's work in global disease outbreaks. The same compassion, counsel, and care will be just as important as we confront this new virus and as many Americans and others around the world experience disruption in their daily lives. That's probably not something you're going to read on the CDC website. But it is so important for us to recall our own history as believers and how God is going to use us for such a time as this. Now, friends, is not the time to hunker down, to hide away. We can take precautions. We need to be safe. But friends, now is not the time to forget our mission. Our mission hasn't changed The world is watching believers. They are watching the church. They want to know how we're going to respond, how our faith is going to impact our hands and our feet and our voices. They want to know what we're going to do to serve our communities. They want to see, friends, a faith that works because the great commission and the great commandments haven't changed. 
Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And friends, love your neighbor as yourself. And as we look out for our own safety and we take precautions and we consider the needs of our own families, we need to consider the needs of others. Paul says in Philippians that we should consider the needs of others as more important than our own. He takes it one step above, but the golden rule, friends, the great commandment to make this, the great commission to make disciples, the great commandment to love our neighbor, those things have not changed. Friends, the world is looking for a faith that bears fruit, a faith that works. Jesus had a lot to say about this in Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, he talks about people as trees, believers, followers of Jesus as fruit-bearing plants. You will recognize them by their fruits. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Friends, what he's talking about is, is the fruit of our lives, the work of our hands, how our faith manifests itself beyond just what we talk about in a room on Sunday morning. Jesus said to his disciples, by this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. The proof is in the fruit. The proof that you are a follower of Jesus is in the fruit of your faith. Trees have a purpose, and that is to multiply. And the seed is in the fruit that falls. And our fruit is the seed that comes forth. In fact, friends, trees don't have any purpose aside from multiplying and bearing fruit. And like trees, friends, we don't have any purpose in following Jesus unless we're bearing fruit, unless we're working. The marks of a genuine faith that we've looked at so far in the book of James are this. Faith endures trials with joy. And faith pursues wisdom. Faith overcomes temptation. And we overcome temptation by understanding sin's source in our flesh and our responsibility to take the means of escape that God will provide. We, we've talked about the fact that faith obeys the word of God and faith controls the tongue. And we're going to talk more about that in chapter 3. Faith seeks integrity. And faith loves everyone without discrimination. The word that James uses, without partiality. Faith works and it produces fruit. That's what we looked at last week. And today we want to look at the next piece of this, which is that faith inspires by example. Faith inspires by example. Friends, what has our example been amidst this crisis? Uh, amidst the pandemic that we are currently facing, how would people characterize your faith? How would people characterize mine? I have a very bold question for you this morning. Something that all of us need to consider. And I don't mean this question in a negative way. I mean this question to be heartfelt Brutally honest. It's going to require something for you to answer. It's going to require something for me to answer. To look in the mirror. To see who I really am. But friends, are you really a follower of Jesus Christ? Are you? How would your faith be described? Are you really a Christian? 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 5, Paul encourages us. He says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Friends, I'm not asking if you've gone to church since you were young. I'm not asking if you prayed a prayer. I'm not asking if you pay your dues, your tithes, your offerings. I'm not asking if you serve in the nursery or in the sound booth. I'm not asking any of those questions. I'm asking, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? See, those are very different questions. And that's what we need to talk about today because the truth is we need to jettison false faith if we are to enjoy true faith. 
And some of us have been holding on to a false faith that doesn't work. And James wants us desperately to examine our faith and to see what genuine faith really looks like. And so he gives us some examples. In your Bible, James chapter 2, starting in verse number 20, James has this to say, Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James is answering a question. A question that he asked in verse number 14. And we kind of looked at the first part of James's response And now we're going to look at the second part, but the question remains the same. Can a workless faith save someone? Is such a faith without works able to save any? Friends, faith without works doesn't work. It is, according to the Greek tongue-in-cheek model of the Scripture here, it is workless. It is worthless. Faith results in salvation and good works. They are two sides of the same coin. And so a lot of people look at this, and James is not pulling any punches. He says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, the foolish opponents to this concept? He's calling them empty, defective imposters. He's calling them frauds. People that think that they can just say a prayer and have faith in God, but it never manifests in their hands and feet, never calls them to serve, doesn't result in any kind of life change. He calls them a fraud, an imposter. And friends, I don't mean this to be a challenging thing for you. I don't mean this to be offensive to you, but the gospel is offensive. And some of us have been sitting in churches for so long that we don't even recognize that we are imposters too. And James wants to call attention to this. And so in the, in the first section that we looked at, verses 14 through 19 last week, we kind of looked at two of these imposters. The first one is the armchair philanthropist. They're the one that the people come and they express their need. And that person says, you go and be blessed and go on your way in peace. That's an armchair philanthropist. They've got great flowery words, but it doesn't result in any action. An armchair philanthropist, they require more than sentiment. Faith requires more than sentiment. And faith requires more than just doctrine. Because, friends, we even saw orthodox demons that understand that God is one. They've got good theology. Good theology abounds in a very real place called hell. That's why it's got to be more than doctrine and more than sentiment. We can't be armchair philanthropists. We're orthodox demons. We need to have a faith that works. A faith that serves. Not a faith that's useless. Or in some of your translations it might say, dead or idle. The idea is it's like fallow ground that produces no fruit. Or money that is yielding no interest. It is unprofitable to everyone. Douglas Redford says this, that God calls us to faith, but not to a passive and lifeless faith that sits idly by doing nothing to impact the world. We are Christ's body, the organism through which he works in the world today. Therefore, let us be active and involved, willing to go where he leads and to do what he wants. But friends, I think what happens when we come to this particular passage of Scripture, especially for those of us that know Scripture well, 
and know, especially Paul's letters very well, who wrote so much of the New Testament. Romans 3.28, Paul says this, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is Paul the Apostle. This is the one that so many laud in the Scriptures. And here's James, who wrote this tiny little letter. And he seems to contradict Paul the Apostle. You see that a person in James 2.24 is justified by works and not by faith alone. And people all of a sudden lose their minds. Friends, what I want you to understand is both of these men of God are saying exactly the same thing. But they're defining their terms ever so slightly differently. Paul is talking about the legalistic works of pharisaical believers who are still trying to live under the law. James is talking about the outworking of true faith. Paul is talking about becoming a child of God. James is talking about being a child of God. Paul is talking about the means of salvation. James is talking about its outcome. Paul is talking about the priority of faith. James is talking about the proof of that faith. Paul is talking about salvation determined by faith, the basis of faith. But James is talking about the demonstration of faithfulness. And these are the differences that we're talking about. Justification involves two different things for believers, for followers of Jesus. And we know that justification is important. The first definition of justification is our acquittal. It's when we stand before the judge and he declares us not guilty. That's such a beautiful thing. Such a powerful reminder for us to know that the judge is our defense attorney. It's hard to lose a case when the judge is your defense attorney. And Jesus represents us. And Jesus clears our name because he took all of the sin upon himself. And so the judge declares us acquitted. Uh, The best way I know how to describe this is the way that I learned it when I was much younger. Justified. It's just as if I had never sinned at all. That's the first definition. That's the acquittal. That's our position before God. But James isn't using the same definition. He's using the second definition of justified, which has to do with our vindication. Our vindication is not showing, is not, is not our acquittal. It's not our position before God. It's our position before others. It's how we are shown to be righteous. We are shown to be faithful. Verse number 22 starts like this. You see. You all see faith as it works. You see that faith was active in Abraham's life along with his works. You see it. Our vindication of our faithfulness before people is what is in mind here by James. And so he gives us two Old Testament inspirations of a living faith. The first one that he gives to us is the person of faith, Abraham, Father Abraham. You guys remember singing that song when we were little kids, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham. The New Testament, Paul calls Abraham not just the father of that nation, not just Israel, but the father of the faithful of all believers throughout all time because of his expression of faithfulness, of faith that works. And Abraham stands as an inspiration of living faith for the Jewish people because he was one of them. He was their ancestor. He was Jewish. He was a male. He was wealthy. He was the revered patriarch. And he showed a faith that worked. In fact, there's another Greek play on words here. It says in verse number 22 that his faith was active along with his works. In Greek, it literally reads, faith worked with his works. Faith worked with his works. Friends, faith, our faith needs to work with our works. It needs to be a faith that works. Hebrews chapter 11 says this. 
about Father Abraham. And you can read much of his story in the Old Testament, but a great synopsis of it is right here in Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse number 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Let me give you just a little bit of context for those that might not know this story. Abraham was called from a land that had been his home, from his own people, from his own family. And he was called to go to the place that God would call him. And God gave him a promise and said that even in his old age, because he was about 75 when he received this call, that even in his old age that he would be given a son, that he would be the father of many people, the father of many nations. And Abraham and his wife, Sarai, they held on to that promise for 25 years before God answered it with the birth of their son, Isaac, which means laughter, because this whole situation is laughable. And yet, God is faithful And Abraham held on to that promise. But can you imagine that he was willing to offer up his only son? God called to him and told him to go to Mount Moriah and there to sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac. And Isaac was no child. He would have been mostly grown by this time, if not a fully grown man. He was complicit in all of this because he trusted his father just as Abraham trusted his heavenly father. Even as Abraham strapped him down to the altar, even as Abraham raised that knife into the air until the angel of the Lord called him and told him to stop because he knew that because of Abraham's willingness, because of his faithfulness, that he wouldn't withhold anything from God. Verse number 18 Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. That was his promise. And he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham had so much faith in God, in that particular expression of faith, that he knew that even God could raise the dead, if that's what he so willed. It's an amazing declaration of faith, a vindication of, of his faith. James even goes so far as to say that it was credited to him, to Abraham, as righteousness. Friends, James is not saying that works saves us. Like Paul, he understands that that is not the case. But Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was credited to him as righteousness. Friends, this is a financial term. It means that the credit came from outside of Abraham. It wasn't based on his works. It was based on his faith. But his faith worked. It showed itself to be true. It was vindicated by his behavior, by his act of trust. And that righteousness was imputed to him from outside of himself. Imagine that you rack up credit card debt. Maybe you're there right now. Maybe you're like so many families in America. But imagine that you called the credit card company to find out if you could do something, if you could arrange some kind of payment schedule that would make it bearable. And imagine that you called them only to find out that your account was paid in full. Friends, it wasn't anything that you did. Just someone else's sacrificial, wonderful generosity that paid your debt. That's what Jesus did. That's what he does for you and for me. That's what was done for Abraham because his faith was credited to him as righteousness. And James could have stopped right there, but he didn't. He picks another Old Testament inspiration of faith. Except this time it's not a person of faith insofar as it's a person of filth to the Jewish people. Rahab wasn't a Jewish man who was wealthy. She was a woman. She was a Gentile. And she was a redeemed prostitute. Friends, later on, because of her act of faithfulness, Rahab would be named in the genealogy of Jesus Christ because later she would marry a man named Salmon. She would be the ancestress of a man named Boaz. 
and uh, Jesse. And then here's a more familiar name, King David, who was the great-great-grandfather of Jesus. All because of her faithfulness. And you ask, what did she do? Well, Joshua chapter 2 kind of tells the story when the people of Israel are going into a nation, a, a warring nation. And Rahab hid the spies that had come into the land. Even at great personal cost, even at tremendous risk to herself and to her own family, she believed God to be true and real. But she didn't just say these things. She did something about it. She believed in the God of Israel, and so she protected his people. And as a reward, she was protected when the nation of Israel came in and took over the land. And Rahab and her family was saved. And friends, from a person of faith to the person of filth, from Abraham to Rahab and everyone in between, faith is justified by works. That's what James wants you to understand. Wherever you think you fall between these two categories of inspirational Old Testament saints, friends, you need to understand that you're in that boat too. You're on that line graph somewhere. You're going to find yourself between Abraham and Rahab. And because of that, you need to know that your faith is justified by your works, but we are justified by faith. I don't want there to be any question. At whatever point, John MacArthur says, at whatever point in the unfolding revelation and work of God men may have lived or will ever live, God requires nothing of them for salvation except true faith in him. But friends, true faith in him, genuine faith in Jesus Christ will always work. It will always serve. It will always manifest in life change. Do you want to be counted God's friend? That's what it says about Abraham, that it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. Isaiah 41, verse number 8 says that, that Abraham was a friend of God. Jesus said the same thing in John 15, verse number 14. You are my friends if you do what I command you. You want to be considered a friend of God? Then we've got to do what he calls us to do. Our faith has to be more than just words. It has to be a faith that works. Friends, Abraham held nothing back from God with prompt and radical obedience. When God called him to sacrifice his one and only son, Abraham didn't even hesitate. He just went. He held nothing back from God with prompt and radical obedience, and Rahab cared for the needy and the helpless with a self-sacrificing love. Go back and read about it in Joshua chapter 2. Go back and read the account of Abraham chronicled through the book of Genesis. Look at their faith, how their beliefs worked. And friends, answer this question, what is your faith like? Is it dead and lifeless or is it working? It's time for some honest evaluation. Are you really a Christian? Are you really a follower of Jesus Christ? Let me read something to you. O.S. Hawkins has a book called Getting Down to Brass Tacks. Advice from James for Real World Christians. James concluded his discourse on faith and works with these words in James 2.26, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. James tied a bow on the ethical effect of faith without fruit by saying that faith and fruit are as essential to each other as the body and the spirit. God never created a body without a soul, and a mere profession of faith without fruit is evidence that such faith is fatal. It is nothing more than a corpse. In the ancient world, someone finding a person who appeared to be dead would hold a mirror under that person's nose. And if marks appeared on the mirror, he knew the body was still alive, though barely breathing. If no marks appeared, he knew the body was dead and good for nothing. Left unburied, he knew the body 
The body would sour and stink and spread disease. And James takes the mirror of God's word and puts it under the nose of us today who claim to have faith to see if anything appears. If nothing appears, if no fruit is produced, that faith is dead. It is good for nothing. If others could see the faith breathing, moving, acting, that faith is alive. The preservation of dead bodies is called mortuary science. Experts who are skilled at beautifying and preserving dead bodies try to make them look lifelike, alive. Likewise, many men and women whose faith is really dead try to look as much as possible like people who are alive. They recite creeds accurately, and they teach them to their children. They pretend to be alive spiritually by referring to some decision they made years ago, yet they live their lifetimes without trusting Christ and with false hope. They are like dead bodies trying to look like something they aren't. Like dead bodies, they don't do anybody any good, and they quickly become offensive. Many church members today have no faith and no works. Some gather to say their creeds and talk about faith and positive thinking, but they have no ongoing ministries to meet people's needs. Others have works without faith. Their approach is motivated simply by social or humanistic values. Biblical Christianity, as we have seen, is not a faith with works. It is a faith that works. George Sweeting, in a commentary he wrote, told the story of Blondin, who was the great tightrope walker, while performing on a cable across Niagara Falls, he asked his audience, how many of you believe I can walk across the cable pushing a wheelbarrow? And the people cheered, and they raised their voices. And he asked again, how many believe I can push the wheelbarrow across the cable with a man in the wheelbarrow? And again, the people cheered, and they clapped, and they wanted to see it. Enthusiastic. And he pointed to one gentleman who seemed particularly excited, and he said, you're my man. Get into the wheelbarrow. Needless to say, that man made a rapid exit. Millions of people are quick to claim a faith in Christ, but many are living with the ethical effect of a faith without fruit. So Jesus is saying to you and to me this morning, get in the wheelbarrow. Do you trust me? In 1887, a young lad who was converted to Christ at a D.L. Moody meeting in Massachusetts, stood up to give a testimony, and he said these now famous words, I intend to trust the Lord from this day forth and to obey him and his word. When John H. Samus heard of that testimony, he penned words that we have sung for over a century. And this chapter of James could be summed up in the lyrics of his hymn. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. That is a faith that works. Friends, the story of Abraham didn't end with Abraham. On the site of that spot, the temple of Solomon was built to commemorate that act of faithfulness that Abraham had, the willingness to sacrifice his only son. But not too many years later, another man was, was sacrificed on that mountain, that same mountain, at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, Abraham named that mountain the place where God provides because God provided a ram caught in the thicket to be the substitutionary atonement for his son, Isaac. And on the mountain of God, he provides, and he provided Jesus. He provided Jesus to die on a cross to pay the penalty for your sin and for mine. And all he asks is that we would trust and obey. He is calling you and me today to follow him in obedience, in faithfulness. Will you do it? God has provided. Would you pray with me today, friends? 
some believers this morning who are hearing this message, they, they're, they're hearing that they need to step it up. They're hearing that they need to have a faith that works, that they may be called from their comfort zone to serve and to love, to do, not because the doing is what saves them, but because they have been saved, they want an outworking of their faith. They want their faith to affect their hands and their feet, their behavior, their attitudes, their heart. But God, there are others who are hearing this who maybe for the first time are saying, you know what? I don't have a real faith. I've never trusted in Jesus. God, for them, I pray that you would touch their hearts this morning. Convict them. You have encouraged us by your word, but you've also challenged us by your word. You've challenged what faith we may think we have to examine ourselves, to test ourselves, to see if we are really following Jesus. And so God, this morning I pray that for any who would say today that they need to have a relationship with God, that they're ready to accept God's free gift of forgiveness, that, Lord, you would impress upon them that today is the day of salvation. And, God, I hope that they would pray with me right now. A prayer of salvation, not, not a magic prayer. There's nothing magical about it, God. But just that they would repeat after me in their own heart, a reflection of their faith. Dear God, that's right, wherever you are, you repeat after me. If you want to receive God's free gift of forgiveness, if you're ready to follow Jesus, repeat after me, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've broken your laws. I know that I deserve to be separated from you. I deserve hell. I deserve to be the one to die on the cross. But you did it. God, please save me. Deliver me. Help me to turn away from my sin. Change my life, God. Help me to follow after you each and every day. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And God, thank you for the promise of heaven. The promise that this is not the end. Guide me through these difficult days. But God, thank you for the peace and for your love and for the joy that you have given to me today. Thank you for saving me. Pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.